The next speaker will be Eric Chesson. He was raised agnostic, but believes in the biblical scriptures and the scriptures given by Joseph Smith to be the inspired word of God. Eric and his wife are approaching 24 years of marriage and have seven beautiful children together. Erica, er, Eric is a retired Marine fighter pilot. He graduated with not gun. Holy four he really studies the word of God and works diligently with his wife to follow the commandments of God in their family's daily life. The spot on the ground in the picture to the left is where oh, he sorry. raised the flag. His presentation, his presentation is titled The Second Great Commandment. What is it? All right. Um, my voice is fairly famous for carrying, so I'm going to forgo the technical difficulties with Mike if that works for everybody. Um, so, a little bit about what's on the screen here and about why, I mean, it's not. The Top Gun thing is not really relevant to God, right? Who cares? Uh, I mean, the, because of the, the recent release of the movie, and, you know, they're Tom doing a good job of trying to make it cool again, right? Okay. Um, but there's nothing godly about it. All right. So let's keep that straight. Um, the, uh, so the kosher dad thing on the screen, um, the, uh, as has been mentioned by a couple others, uh, the, uh, you know, when you, when you start on this journey and on this path, uh, I, I think probably all of us share at some point somebody accusing us of being Jewish. Um, and uh, it happens, you know, it happens, right? Um, and so the kosher dad thing started as somewhat of a joke because there's nothing kosher about me. I'm not trying to be kosher. Uh, I'm trying to read this book and do what it said, okay? And that sounds kosher to some people, uh, but there are things that are kosher that aren't in this book, and I'm, I'm not trying to figure that out. Um, so that's where the kosher dad thing comes from. The, uh, now, as far as the, the Top Gun thing, um, the only reason I, I bring that up is to give you this agnostic topic. So I'm different than everybody else has spoken so far, okay? I, I'm very different, okay? Uh, I was raised uh, without God, okay? Um, and then uh, through a series of things that would be a lot longer story, not really relevant, you know, I, I graduated from Top Gun in February of 2000. The uh, dream come true. There was no God in my life. It was all focused on that goal. Uh, I saw the movie as a 15 year old kid in the summer of 1986. That seemed pretty cool. Uh, and then now looking back, God kept opening doors. Um, that, I mean, when I saw that movie, I was 15 years old. I was, uh, probably almost my current height of six feet tall, and I maybe weighed about 20, maybe. I was a karate kid. I was not the athlete. I am not, I was not the guy that you would have looked at in high school and said, that guy is gonna be a fighter pilot. Farthest thing from the truth. Now, the reason I bring it up is because I think based on the movie and, and, this, and all the stuff that goes along with it, when you guys think about a fighter pilot, you probably, and the things that are required to do so, so you probably think about it as a super complex thing. And a lot of the talks we've been doing so far are, get, are getting into super complex stuff. It is, it, it looks that way, but it's actually the complete opposite, okay? It's the mastery of the basics done rapidly in succession, okay? And because that, it, that's not just, that's, that's what I am, like Tom says in the movie, it's what I am. I was, I, I was born to be that. And, but that has significant implication about how I read this and how I get my approach to what I'm about to talk about and why I think it's so important, okay? The basics matter, okay? And what happens after Christ comes back? Uh, I mean, amazing stuff, no doubt, but he's gonna be here to explain it. So I don't feel an obligation to try to figure it out now. I've got some important things to do to prepare, okay? And and, and that's my overall approach. Uh, and so that's sort of where that comes down to. Now, 
I think, so last year, some of you were here for it. Last year, I talked about the first great commandment. And I alluded to the idea that I tied the first, I mean, it's already been brought up, right? The first great commandment ties directly to the Shema. And, but then, and then I, I came to do it because it was just starting to develop for me. That the Shema actually ties directly to the Passover. And, and in the time since then, I've expanded. I've seen that just has just blown up in my mind of, of how that's true. But that's, that's last year's talk. Okay, this year is the second great commandment. And, and the second great commandment and the importance of it hit me first. Uh, and I started to dive into it. And then I had one of these moments of this physical tap on the shoulder uh, of what do you do in studying the second great commandment? You haven't studied the first. And that's why the, that's why last year was the first great commandment. Uh, and, uh, and I just had to get through that in order for God to even allow me to dive into this. Okay. Um, so for those, probably the easiest way to summarize the first great commandment to love God just to just bear it down a thing, Christ told us, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that's the that's the that's the end of the, I mean that's not the end of the story, but you get the idea. That's the very root of it. Okay. But then he goes on and talks about the second great commandment. Now, why is this so important? Okay. It's so important because would we not agree that we are so I noticed there was some hesitation to throw a date on when the second coming might be. Because people in this room are smart enough to know that if you throw down a date, and that date doesn't turn out to be so good, there's a penalty for that, okay? But can we agree in this room that we are closer to the second coming than we are to the first? <laughs> All right. I thought maybe I had it. Okay? Can we agree in this room that we agree, everybody here agrees that Jesus the Christ is who he said he was? Okay? So we don't have any work to do there, is my point. That's like that's great, but we don't have any work to do there. But he gave us a task to be prepared for when he came back the second time. So that has been the focus of my life uh, since my awakening. Um, and what it currently is the focus of my life. Okay. So that's where that's where I approach this, this topic from. Now I think you all here would understand that we are in a war, okay? We are in a spiritual battle, okay? And that the intent that it, I think it's fair to say that the persecution has begun. We've all probably felt it to some level or another. And would we all agree in this room that we anticipate the persecution is going to only intensify from here, okay? Would we all agree that our current goal, really, exaltation sounds great, but our current goal is to still be standing here when he returns. We might not, that might not work out for all of us, but man, what a great goal, right? To still be standing. Well, with the persecution that it talks about, we're gonna need some protection in order to make that happen. That's not as, as, as awesome as I am because I'm a fighter pilot, I'm not good enough to take care of myself or my family from the persecution that's coming, right? Now we can still go to Costco, that's an evil organization that sells we've now learned. So you get the idea, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So the uh, so that that's my point. Okay. Now this came, this was something that was developing, but through COVID, and if there's a blessing of COVID, it is there's an awakening going on. Okay. It is illuminating a lot. Okay. Not for everybody, but for some. Okay. And so this sort of came about, and so just real quick. So the, the it's a, a stay away from the long story of how we got to Utah, but we got to Utah a little over four years ago now. Um, because of my background, I wanted to, I knew, so I knew that the majority of my neighbors would be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, not Mormons, I now know, because I was there in the conference center when it was explained to me by a guy named Russell that we're not going to say that anymore. We're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Not me, per se, but many of you. Um, the, uh, I love that. I, I love that. Like you have no idea. That's the evil fighter pilot me. Um, but the uh, but anyway. So I knew I knew that there would be a lot that we agreed on. Okay, keeping the commandments of God is a, is is for right up front. Right, keeping the Sabbath. I don't necessarily agree on the day, but that is a drastic departure, as many of you know, from Christianity that would drive from Catholicism. Okay, 
So that's not a small thing. And I recognize that. And so I knew there would be more that I agreed with than I disagreed with. And I also knew there would be a language barrier. So in preparation, in order to get to know my neighbors, because we're going to have to count on each other uh, when this thing goes south, I read the Book of Mormon, not looking for what I disagreed with, but what, looking for what I agreed with and to learn the language. And then uh, because I found, you know, I pulled it with a, another testimony of Jesus Christ, and I kept calling back uh, from Florida where I was training at the time, joking with my wife, Bridget, that uh, there ain't no Jesus Christ in this thing. But what it does keep talking about is it keeps talking about the commandments of God. And in the context, that can only mean Torah, or based on that whole thing that you guys know better than I do about how they got out of there. And the, uh, but they're cheating. They're not saying what they are. So you they can't, can't be wrong because it doesn't ever define them. In other words, how can you understand this book if you don't have the prerequisite knowledge of the first five books? Okay. You can't skip that. Okay. Can't. And, and I obviously in this room, we agree. So, so that's, so then once I get, once I read that, then at that point, uh, we, we, we settled in a house in Kaysville, uh, and in order to, you know, as you guys know, if you want to know your neighbors around here, you could go to sacrament service because that's where they all are. So I attended sacrament service for over a year, leading all the way up to when sacrament service ended because of COVID. Okay, um, I participated in every single thing I was invited. If I was invited, I was there. And as you guys know, if you send the invitation and I show up, guess what I get? I get another invitation, right? It keeps going. I have attended two general conferences in person, in person because of that, which is why I was there when he explained the name of the church and so on and so forth. Um, but then COVID happened, okay? So COVID happens, and, and when COVID happens, sacrament service stopped, okay? So at that point, I'm like, you know what? This is an excellent opportunity. A couple of things have happened of to, to, to do scripture study in home. So the uh, so I started doing uh, I started offering out scripture study to and and I started encouraging people that we might want to consider starting on page one, um, and the uh, and so I did that in a couple of different areas. That's that's how I got to know uh, uh, Brett and Pamela, who we are now in fellowship together, which is just such a wonderful thing. But uh, I started doing that with my neighbor, okay, the guy the guy that was the most welcoming of all my exceptionally welcoming neighbors, and we started going through the Torah, okay. At, mostly at his house, uh, at his dining room table, and we started working our way through it. But then, uh, then this happened. Then this happened, which is apparently not. <laughs> I'm hitting arrows. I'm hitting the arrows. I'm trying down and uh, right. Click, click on the screen just uh, to uh, yeah. make sure that it's. There we go. Enter. All right. So here's what we're going to talk about. Okay. We're going to talk about what the world thinks, what the second great commandment actually talks about, what the Torah connection is, the theme of the, the conference, right? Um, and then we need to get into the true definition of neighbor. Uh, and because of that, we need to get into mercy and then love. So these are the topics that we're going to talk about. Okay. So what does the world think about it? Well, this came, came down to masks and social distancing. So here we go. June 20, 2020. Many of you may remember this. Okay. So what's going on, all right? So we went from masks won't do any good and we need to save them from healthcare workers to the Surgeon General of the United States of America making a YouTube video of how to turn a t-shirt into a mask and saying that that matters, okay? And so then we had the governor, the, the then governor of the state of Utah saying he would never mandate it because you know Utahs are awesome and so whatever the excuse was. Um, but he wasn't getting enough compliance. And so he apparently approached the church in order to get the, the church to help him get more compliance, right? Okay, so what did this statement say? The statement said, uh, over the last, so this is the whole thing, but we've got alarming increases in COVID. The state epidemiologist has identified that it's, you guys won't comply with the masks and social distancing. That's the problem. Um, and I'm, by the way, I'm struggling not to turn my voice into fighter pilot because when I'm talking about life and death in front of fighter pilots, I use more colorful language because if that offends you, we're talking about blowing people to smithereens. So that's an offensive thing on its own. But so work with me here in case one slips out. Uh, the, uh, all right. So if you're saying the masks and the social distancing are the problem, okay? Now, here's where it goes off track in a way that got my attention and it should have got yours. 
D, the undersigned faith community leaders appeal to the people of faith all over the state to wear masks and practice physical distancing, sacrificing a small measure of comfort for the sake of saving lives. We recall that the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is like unto it, to love one's neighbor as oneself. One cannot claim to love one's neighbor while deliberately putting them at risk, implying if you don't comply, you are putting your neighbor at risk. Okay? That is a physical threat of violence. Okay? So, pray the epidemic, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So please join us and just do it. Okay? Who signed it? We got the first counselor of the Utah Area Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ. We got the Catholics. We got the Baptists. And I didn't, it was too long of a thing to fit on the slide. And sadly, that is my heart. We got the two rabbis from the Chabad to sign this thing. Okay? This, the rabbi of the Chabad of Whittier is a dear friend of mine. I spent a great deal of time with him. Uh, and it really crushed me that those guys signed on to this because, you know, we, we in here can tie this to the Torah, but this is New Testament, right? And what are those dudes signing that for? Okay? But, whatever. Um, so, so I took this to my neighbor's house, and I said, today we're not going to talk about Torah. We need to talk about this. And I said, this is a big problem. And he said, what are you talking about? It's all about love. And you know, the lovey-dovey love that gets talked about so much that makes me get a little taste of vomit in the back of my throat. Okay? <laughs> so, the, uh, so, I forgot to point this out. I keep this with me quite a bit. For those who can't see it, it says, stay humble and kind. Okay? I, I'm a classically trained, world-class fighter pilot, the best of the best, if you will. Uh, there's not a lot that's humble and kind about that. Okay? So I've been told that to anybody less aggressive than a fighter pilot, I don't necessarily come across as humble and kind. Um, but I'm trying. That's why I carry that around. Okay, so, all right, so I said, this is a big problem. And he was like, hey, give me the why I love thing. I said, no, 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 no. This is a call to violence. And he's like, what are you talking about? It's anything but that. And I said, no, this is a call to violence. Because if I walk up to you and threaten violence to you and your family, are you not morally justified and obligated to defend yourself and for sure your family? Preemptively, if I point a gun in your face, you need to take me out. If, more importantly, if I point a gun at your child's face, you need to take me out. Make sense? And that's what this is at its root cause. And he was, he was, no way, this is love. And I was like, this is anything but. And oh, by the way, on June 24th, whatever that was, I said, oh, by the way, this isn't about masks. It's so a long story why I knew this, but I said, this is about a vaccination. Okay? So this is going to morph into if you don't get vaccinated, you don't love your neighbor. And all the violence along with it. And look at the threats of violence take away your livelihood, the ability to provide for your family, and so on and so forth, that we have suffered since then. And he was, beside, at this point, I was almost getting kicked out of the house, okay? It was that, there's no way, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, look at the church. Look at how the church feels about vaccination, okay? The church is going to be the one that pushes this, not just this church, the church, Okay, it's going to be a big, big problem. And he could, you know, just absolutely insist that people, by the way, was on the city council of Kaysville. And so they did all their nonsense. Again, each step of the way, everything I told him as it happened that he said would never happen, he would then, it was like, it was like we never had that conversation. It was like a fresh start all over again. And he was at his cognitive dissonance where he just couldn't even see it. He could not remember the previous conversation at all, it seemed. Okay, so what do we get next? Okay, I'm telling you, this is going to turn into if you're not vaccinated, you don't love your neighbor, which he just couldn't possibly battle. So then we get to June 14th, 2021, and the Vice President of the United States is speaking, and this might need the mic. Okay, I don't even know where she is. That, that website at the bottom there, is whitehouse.gov and you can go there and the text of the speech is is there okay 
but the part we care about is captured on this little video right here. So if we can do this. Can we hear it? see it then and he couldn't see it after it happened all right that's a big problem all right so why is this important all right so we need to choose our words carefully because if we don't if we use worldly definitions of the word of god they're going to use it against us to persecute us they're already doing it all right so if you don't have a rock, solid, firm understanding of what the second great commandment is, then when they persecute you with it, you won't be able to defend yourself. You won't be able to stand on the solid foundation of God and his word. So that is why we have to understand. We have to define these words by God's definition, not the definition of the world and the only way to do that is to use his word make sense so that's how i approach everything okay and the way i do that by the way is i hit a subject and i try to compile in one place because as you guys know it gets shotgun blast throughout scripture now i don't go to the the, the newer scriptures if you will I, I i stick with the biblical scriptures but i try to grab any biblical scripture at all that's referencing the same subject, compile it into one place and read them all together, okay? And what I have personally found by doing that is that gets, especially if you're working with one translation, right? So if you're working with, it doesn't, all translations have issues, right? Can we agree on that? They all have issues. But when you do that, my finding is it gets past that. Because now you see it in the same context. You might not get everything, but you're going to get the big picture. And that, I think, is the secret to getting through the translational errors, uh, absent, uh, absent the ability to learn the Hebrew. Okay. And even if we did mean, my other point is, even if we do learn the Hebrew, uh, again, language changes over time. There's a lot of difficulties there as well. Um, so we need to stick to using God's word in context, put them together, and that's where. That's what's working for me, okay? And I can give you a story about why, I do, why I'm not blessed to be able to learn multiple languages. And maybe if I know you guys more, that would change. But, um, but that's where I'm at right now, okay? So, second great commandment. As most of you in this room will know, it comes from three different places, okay? And it's already been brought up several times. So we're not gonna go into each and every single one of these, uh, or I'm not gonna read them all, but here's Matthew, okay? The reason I like, or sorry, this is Mark. Matthew's on the next one, sorry. So this is Mark. The reason I like the one from Mark is because Mark is the one that quotes the Shema. And so there's no doubt whatsoever he is pointing to a specific place in Scripture, okay? And can we not agree that if Jesus the Christ points to a specific place in Scripture, we probably ought to pay attention to it. We probably ought to study the whole context of the place that he's pointing at. In this case, the Shema, which is he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. But as most of you here know, the Shema is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, which is how I get to the Passover from there, by the way. Different subject. 
Okay, so bottom line is, but then he, he gives us this. Okay, so then you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Everybody, well, probably most people, if not everybody in this room, knows again, he's quoting Torah, Leviticus 19. Okay, so that's what he does. Nothing of myself, but of my father, right? So he's not coming up with new stuff. So in Matthew, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Luke, you shall love the Lord, your God, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Same, same, same. Okay, so. We ought to pay attention to where that comes from. That's Leviticus 19, 18, or sorry, 19, 18, okay? And so we get, you shall not take vengeance nor bear of any grudge against the older, uh, against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord, okay? So he didn't just pull it out of thin air. Um, and, uh, and so then, a couple things, and we brought it up in previous talks. By the way, we're so I forgot to mention one other thing about black string. Okay, so the uh, one other thing. So uh, this shirt. So I was going to wear my leather jacket because you know how cool yeah. Uh, but the uh, but then Zoe spoke. Okay, and Zoe spoke about using God's word as a weapon. Okay, and we're talking, and that's what I'm talking about here. Okay, uh, except so this this shirt I, or this hoodie I've got on. It's arming the saints, which I, I drug <laughs> or read to. Uh, uh, Slightly different than the sacrament service, shall we say? Um, but the uh, uh, so arming the saints. With the, so this was a men's retreat, and the, the theme of this was that we needed to arm ourselves with the Word of God to protect ourselves from this persecution. So it's right in line with this, and and a bunch of the same points. So there were there were a bunch of talks that were given. There was uh, two of us were given uh, to split up uh, how the sword of God and the shield of God, which are, are tightly uh, together as, as we dug into this. I ended up talking about the sword of God, and then one of the other brothers talked about the, the shield. But one of the talk, one of the takeaways from that that I came up with was I'm not good enough to expertly wield the word of God. Okay, I don't think any of us are. So far, there's only been one, and he did it quite well. Uh, oh, by the way, there was a maybe you could maybe argue too because obviously because Moses right so he's going to smite them and Moses ultimately first he said take me instead he goes no it doesn't work that way but then Moses actually turns back the wrath of God with the word of God he quotes it back to him okay and that that so that's some pretty powerful stuff there how powerful is the word of God it's powerful enough to turn back the wrath of God let that sink in a little bit right Okay, but so the sword thing, and so my takeaway from that was it's really more it's because we're not the full experts. It's probably for us more about the shield to protect us from this coming persecution that I'm talking about. So that's what arming the saints is all about, and I love Zoe's talk. Um, so, so then it comes into okay, so we got to talk about okay, so what is this good neighbor, right? So what is so what is neighbor, all right? Um, because we're talking about we have to love our neighbor, okay. Okay, well, is that the stranger? Well, who is this neighbor, right? And so luckily somebody asked, and this has been brought up several times, so I, I'm not going to go through the whole Good Samaritan. I'm just going to hit the highlights here. So he gets asked, who's my neighbor? He gives the Good Samaritan story and then asks, so which one is it? Who's the good neighbor, right? And he says, it's to him who showed mercy, all right? It's the guy that showed mercy, all right, is what he says. Now, when I went through, so when I first opened up to page one and did my first read, First read ever, okay? Um, and the uh, and so I'm going along, and and we were at the time we were in uh, we were near Wilmington, North Carolina, near Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and the uh, and and we were we were looking for somewhere to have fellowship. And I think at the time, summer, I was around some Christians. I don't remember if that was the church we were going to at that moment or whatever. But I, I, I it came up, and I mentioned that I I had opened up to page one and was reading through, and they're like, oh, rude, and I'm like. I'm not really feeling the brutalness. I do, I, I do struggle to pay attention to the bagats. Not gonna lie, um, but I may mention that I had just finished Leviticus, and this I don't remember who this person I was talking to, but they're like, "Oh, that one's the worst. That one's absolutely, you know, that's wrath of God stuff there. That's tough to read." And I was like, in my gut, I mean, I didn't know much yet. But I was like, you know, I didn't. That's not what the takeaway was to me. Okay, so is there mercy? In Leviticus 19 of all places. All right, so let's look at the things that Leviticus 19, which is in the full context of how to love your neighbor. All right, so we're supposed to leave the gleanings for the poor and the stranger from our field in order to feed those who can't feed themselves. That seems pretty merciful. We're not supposed to cheat them. 
Sounds merciful to me. We're not supposed to put a stumbling block before them. Do no injustice and judgment. Don't gossip. Man, wouldn't it be great if we took this stuff serious? If we didn't think that it had an end and we didn't pay any attention to it, what all that stuff away. I know, right? Man, so that Leviticus stuff, that's <laughs> tough. Continuing. Notice one of them's in red. You shall surely refuse. We'll come back to that one. You shall not mistreat a stranger. Okay? So the guy you don't agree with that just happens to be nearby, can't be giving that to him. You shall love the stranger as yourself. Let's take it to another level. Okay? On a scale of weights, now that you could say that's don't cheat again. And then we get therefore at the end. So what's the point? Therefore, you shall observe all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them. I am. Right? Okay. So now they're all supposed to be merciful. Does the Church of Nice think rebuking people is. Nice, merciful. Nice. My my experience thus far in the state of Utah would be a resounding no. They want to get along with everybody. They want everybody to love them. And if you rebuke somebody, they won't love you. Okay. Now, but what does the Word of God have to say about this? Oh, by the way, let's not forget that this. So the, the verse that he quotes is verse 18. This is verse 17. This is right before it, which says, I'm new King James guy. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor. Okay? You shall. Shall is an important word. Surely is an important word. Rebuke. Neighbor, right? Okay. So... How does this apply? We talked about, uh, somebody talked about yesterday. Uh, it's not a good idea. I think it was you. Don't beat the crap out of them with it, right? That's not going to go very well. I, we probably all had experiences like that. They didn't want to hear it. I would argue that goes back to Exodus 12. They have to want to. If they don't want to, they're not going to pay attention. Turns out, if you read the Proverbs of the day, there's some good stuff in there that relates to this and other things. Proverbs 9, verse 7 through 8. He who corrects, rebukes, a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, some maybe in here, women as well, and he will love you. Okay, wait a minute. Rebuke is tied to love? Rebuke is tied to love. Okay, but you have to choose wisely because some people are not worthy. Okay, so there's some discernment that needs to go on there. But how about for those who are? How about for those that are seeking to align their life with the will of God? Proverbs 25, 11 through 12. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver, like an earring of gold, an ornament of fine gold, is a wise rebuker to an obedient ear. There's a point. Proverbs 28, 23. He who rebukes a man will find more favor afterward than he who flatters with the tongue. The biggest compliment I ever got in my professional life was I was an exchange instructor for the Air Force instructing F-16. We had a hammer of an instructor who failed students left and right. And one class, I failed more students than he did. And at the end of the, uh, the graduation ceremony, they named me as the most influential, best instructor for them. They called me Top Knight because we were the Emerald Knights. Um, and, and, and that told me that with that class, for that moment in time, I successfully pulled off Proverbs 28, which meant something. Okay, probably meant more than anything else, any other award I ever got. Okay, so, but the Church of Nice, uh -uh. Okay, that's love your neighbor. That's love your neighbor. They're telling us not to do it. That's a problem. Okay, now. So, why? Well, we got to look at love. Okay, 
And if we use a worldly definition of love, that's where the train goes off the tracks. Because love in the worldly definition is, you guys tell me if you think I'm off base here, but it's tied to, if it feels good, it is good. It's tied to instant gratification. It's tied to all kinds of things like that, okay? It's tied to this nice concept, okay? Uh, and I would, I would suggest that that is the, the, that is the enemy lying to the world about what love is, okay? So what we need to do is try to figure out in this cryptic thing called the scripture, should we possibly figure out what God thinks, wants us to think that love is, okay? And so I, as you know, it's all over the place, but I just, there's time and I pulled only a couple, okay? So let's look at uh, John, in the book of John. Let's see, oh, this is love. This is love. There's no ambiguity there. This is what it is, according to the author of John, who was supposed to be inspired by God. Huh. That we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. What was the root? What was the underlying thing of the first great commandment? If you love me, if you love your neighbor, keep my commandments. That's love. Okay? Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, love God, love your neighbor, does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Uh-oh. You don't do this. You don't abide in Christ. You don't have the Father and the Son in your life. This love thing. They're like, so I, I've got I, I got plenty of Sunday school teaching in the year plus that I attended sacrament service. And every time we talked about love and used examples of all the love that the church is spreading throughout the world, it was, I assure you, all the worldly definition of the word. This was not included, as you all well know. Okay? This is love. It doesn't, I mean, I'm just a dumb Marine, right? I can figure that one out. It's direct. I like direct. All right, then we get, uh, it's probably easier to read from here. Okay, so now it talks about, now we start talking about, by this we know that we know him. Okay, so we know that we know him. Wouldn't you agree it's important to know Christ? It's important to know God. If, again, no shocker here, if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Oh, that hurts. You know, that should hurt. It doesn't, obviously, but it should hurt many in the Christian faith. A liar. And the truth is not in him. That is a stunning rebuke in my mind. First John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why are we trying to be good global citizens? Strikes me that we're trying to be good global citizens so that they'll like us, so that they'll receive our message. That doesn't fit here to me. First John 5, 2 through 3. By this, we know that we love the children of God. This ties with loving your neighbor, right? The children, other children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments, no shocker there. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, emphasis. In. And then, of course, and his commandments are not burdensome. Moses told us that. Christ told us that. The author of 1 John is telling it to us again. It's not supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be easy. Okay? It's probably, my thoughts, probably hard because the world around us is not doing it. And they're actively trying to get us not to do it either. And that's why it feels hard to us. John 15. Now, here's where it, to me, gets really interesting. As the Father loved me, I have loved you. We're trying to be more like Christ, right? And so he's following an example of his Father, and then he's showing us this example. Abide in my love. How did Christ love us, like, actively? Well, he was here during his ministry. Did he not... Fully teach us 
the Torah. And in doing so, tied us to the first and second great commandments. You should do what I'm doing. I'm teaching you how, and I want you to teach it to your children. Shema. Okay? Uh, so that's the example he set. He perfectly taught it. I believe that in most of the cases where we we use we in English we use the word fulfill. In many of those cases, it's not fulfill as in I did it all. It can't be in many of those places. It's fulfill as in I fully taught it to you. I didn't skip anything. I taught you everything. There are places where fulfill means it's done. I've done it all. But there are a bunch of other places where people apply that same concept where it does not fit. Okay? And I'll just leave that at that because that's not this lecture. But if you keep my commandments, then, inserted, you will abide in my love. Okay? Wait a minute. Now we're talking about conditional statements. If. Remember? So, so we, wanted, we wanted to know God. We have to abide in him. If we don't abide in him, we don't. Apparently, we're not going to get his love. Well, he loves everybody. Well, he wants to, but we've got an active role to play in it. We have to tell him we want it. Okay? Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide his love. So what's the example? I keep the commandments. So then it's a, a, a fairly, well, I'll get to that in just a second. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay? So then that bears a couple of questions. Okay, so, so you should love one another as I have loved you. Well, what, how did he love us? He taught us the Torah. So we should be teaching our children. We should be teaching our neighbors. We should teach anybody that wants to know. Okay? And then, along with that, the one valid thing is, okay, so... Keep my commandments. I kept my father's commandments. You keep my my commandments. So then, I think there is a valid question to be had there. Are is there any difference between the two? I would argue, and I think many of you would argue, no. There's no difference in the two. But as you well know, mainstream Christianity would. The interesting question is when you ask them, okay, what are these commandments I'm supposed to be keeping? It gets to be a pretty mushy, gray, fuzzy answer after that. Okay, um, which it just is, right? So that's that, that's the way the world we're surrounded by is. Okay? But I think we would agree that these sets of commandments are not, they're, they're not mutually, they're not different. They're, they're woven together, and that point has been made by several speakers so far. So I, I, I assume we're largely in agreement on that point. Okay? So then it says, if you, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you. Okay? So this is another key point that we're going to get into in just a second here. I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. So, Jesus the Christ told us, if we do this, the world is going to hate us. Okay? So, why in the flip is it a goal to get the world to love us? Is it like, oh yeah, Jesus? Hold my beer. I'll prove you wrong, and I'm going to get the world to love me. I'm just going to keep pouring love over them until they love me back. Okay? Right, is that what we're trying to do? Because it sure feels like it to me. Okay? I don't think that's a good idea to tell Jesus the Christ he was wrong. I'll show you. All right? Now, getting back to this idea of chose you. He chose me. Okay? In other words, and this ties into the concept that's been brought up several times. I can't do this of myself. The best I can do is everything that I can to be qualified to be chosen. I don't get to make that call. It's not mine to make. All right? And that is central to my thoughts on so much of this. So, in summary, nailing my timing. Uh, in summary, okay, if I am going to impart one thing on you, it is love is not a feeling. Love is an action. That action is to keep the commandments of God that lead to a feeling of love. Let's think about this for just a second. Let's use some extreme, just hypothetical examples that happen in the world around us all the time. So you got a, you got a, a, a man and a wife, and maybe they have a family, whatever, okay? And that man, again, cultural language just, all, just got him kind of, uh, that man is an abusive husband, physically, spiritually, 
uh, just, just left and right. But then he says, I'm sorry, I love you. Do you think his family feels love? Okay, now let's take a cold hearted SOB like me, who apparently doesn't have an empathy chip, if you ask my wife. Again, if you're not at least as aggressive as a fighter pilot. Um, the, uh, the, uh, Never. Now, this isn't this isn't how I do my life. But let's take somebody who never tells their family that they love them. However, that guy works his butt off, keeps the commandments, provides for his family's every need, both emotionally, spiritually, physically, feeds them, shelters them, so on and so forth, and everything they need to take care of. You think they feel loved? Darn Skippy, right? Okay. Love is an action. The words are empty without the action. And that action is to keep the commandments. Okay? It's that simple. And so anytime we're talking, and it's a funny thing in the, so in the fighter pilot world, um, the, uh, a lot of this stuff is highly refined over the years, and there is a way to do things. Okay? You do, you do it this way, and, and this is the tactic, this is how it works. You see this, you do this. Okay? These things are very mechanical in nature, like I talked about at the beginning. It's a, it's a collection of very basic tasks executed very well in rapid succession. Not unlike MASH. Anybody old enough to, to run up watching MASH? Okay. So they remember, okay, so when uh, BJ leaves and in comes Winchester and he's this brilliant surgeon and they're trying to get him to do meatball surgery and trying to get him to go faster. Does anybody remember his response every time they tried to get him to go faster? Does anybody remember? One thing at a time. I do it right. I do it very well, and then I move on. He just explains how to be a fire pilot. Okay? Now, we get back to this idea of he chose. He chooses them. Okay? Um, these things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Tie that along with Matthew, get out of the way here. Matthew 22 14. Many are called, but few are chosen. Okay? Few. I don't know exactly what few means, but I'll bet it's a smaller number than most of us are thinking. Okay? Uh, is it going to be the entire, like, so in the, in the scope of churches and religions of the world, Although here, in this location, it sort of feels like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is massive. It isn't, right? On a world scale. However, I'll bet it's still bigger than the few. Make sense? All right. So then that begs the question, who will he choose? What's the qualification? Matthew 25, 11 through 12. This is the story of the ten virgins. Okay. Afterward, the other so you guys know the story, right? So they were supposed to keep their lamps. Five of them did. Five of them didn't. They get the idea. We understand Christ is coming back. Okay, the bridegroom. And we've had the marriage talk this week or the, yesterday. Um, so he's coming back. Five of them aren't ready. Eight can borrow some of your own. No, nope, we do that. There won't be enough. Go out and get some of your own. They go on, come back to the door. And what does he, who is presumably Christ, say to them when he answers the door? Surely I say to you. I do not know you. And they don't get let in. The door gets slammed in their face. Why? Because they didn't do what they were supposed to do, what they were commanded to do, to keep their lamps ready. And just in case there is any ambiguity about what we're talking about here, Proverbs of the Day. I love Proverbs of the Day. 623, for the commandment is a lamp. Okay, the lamp, it's not symbolic of the commandment. It is. Okay, there's no symbolism here. He tells us directly in the Proverbs what he's talking about. And the law is a light. What else is a light? What's the light of the world? Who's the light of the world? Christ is the light of the world. Is he not also described as the living word of God accurately? He is the embodiment of it. Right? He is it. It's one in the same. Okay? So, so this story is about keeping the commandments as a requirement for the remarriage that we talked about earlier. It's not optional. Then we have the other story in Luke 13. 
And now he says, when he, when he tells them, get away from me, but he will say, I tell you again, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me. And we get another glimpse. All you workers of iniquity. What's that? Who is a worker of iniquity? What is iniquity? Anybody? Yeah. It's transgression of the law. What's transgression of the law? It's lawlessness. It's sin. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Transgression of the law is sin. We'll get it right there. Okay? So who is he talking about that he doesn't know? He's talking about those who don't or won't keep the commandments. Okay? So back to who is he going to choose? He's going to choose. Who would you choose for your team? Do you choose strangers? Or would you choose from people you know and trust? So what is the qualification? The qualification is to abide in his love. What's the requirement to do that? To keep the commandments. If you keep the commandments, he knows you personally. Now, he knows everybody, right? He would like, he would like that everybody would do this, but we're stiff neck idiots and we won't, right? Or many of us, right? We won't even try. Uh, those in this room presumably are making the effort, okay? And if we do that, then he knows us. Now, does that mean he will choose us? Now, some of us will be martyrs, right? And so on and so forth. But at least we're in the running, okay? Because many will be called. A bunch of them will choose not to keep the commandments, the mustard seed, all that kind of stuff, right? But those who do, at least now you're in the running. Why? Because you know God and he knows you. And so now maybe when many are called, few are chosen, maybe you get selected, right? But that's not up to us. So I can't, I can't worry about things beyond my control. Uh, you know, when I was a very young child, uh, my mother decided that she was an alcoholic. I don't have any negative connotation or experience. I'm not even sure why she decided that, to be completely honest. But we went through, uh, we went through the 12 steps, whatever, as a family, you know, they were divorced at that point, but as a family. And at the end, they gave us a medallion with the serenity prayer at the back. And I can't quote it, serenity prayer, I have it on my phone, but I can't quote it. But basically it said, you know, the things, you know, do what you can with what you can, and then nothing with the things you can't affect, and the wisdom to know the difference. Well, where does wisdom and knowledge come from? The word of God. We get that from, again, the Proverbs of the day, all right? Um, and so that's it, okay? So lo and behold, the second great commandment. Well, heck, it's the same as the first. It's to keep the commandments of God, okay? And why? The two main points that I'm trying to drive home is we need to understand that they're going to use this against us to persecute us, and we need to be standing on the rock, okay, to be able to stand up against that. And, because, and to be able to exercise the no muscle when that's hard, okay? It's one thing to say no when it's easy. It's an entirely different thing if your children are starving or whatever, right? And so we need to be rock solid on this because we ain't seen nothing yet, okay? It's going to get harder, not easier. And where, where does character come out? When it's hard, not when it's easy. And we need to get ready. And so we need to be doing it for that reason. And then the other reason is many will be called, few will be chosen. We need to qualify. We need to qualify. And we, we can't make, I don't get to make the choice, but I can do the actions required to be qualified or at least give it everything I've got. And so that's what I leave you with, is put in that effort and focus on the basics. Focus on the basics because if we don't make it, if we don't make it to them, if we don't make it to be a martyr, if we don't, if we can't stand on that foundation, if we can't do that, why are we talking about exaltation? If we can't do this stuff, you think you're going to get selected for exaltation? If you can't even get selected to be many will be called, few will be chosen? Give me a break. we got to nail the basics. Be a good fighter, Rob. Nail the basics. And that, I yield.
You might. If you ask me any mind blowing questions, I'm going to say that's not basic. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Oh my gosh. That's just a comment. I'm off the hook. Assume for just a moment that you love your neighbor as yourself, quote unquote, meant what those people who attempted to use it as a weapon during COVID, still are, by the way, thought uh, it did, or wanted to make us think it did. And let us assume uh, that also, as they thought or wanted us to think, that masking, social distancing, et cetera, is love, quote unquote. Well, even by that logic, those who chose not to do such such things would not be morally obligated to for their neighbor's sake. By that logic, they do not love themselves. They are not obligated, they're not so obligated to love their neighbor. Of course, I reject the entire premise of the above paragraph, uh, but still, if they want to twist things, sometimes you can twist them back. And at least I enjoy that. Now, I, you know, um, <laughs> Trust me, I had Brett, Pamela, and Mike, uh, who I had to go to the child thing and get a test if they're getting to be better. Um, oh man, I love banter. Um, that's, I mean, that's one of the best parts of being a fighter pilot is, you know, I can, I can say offensive things and I don't get fired. Um, the, um, but we win with truth, okay? We win with truth. We lose if we get down to their level, okay? So, yeah, it's fun, but standing on the rock of truth, his word, is, is what we're going to need to get the protection. <laughs> Sir, you had your hand. No. Sir. What, what then, um, in Uh, well, what do I come back with? Yeah. Like if somebody hits me with that right now? Yeah, right. Um, give us a short answer. Oh, in two sentences. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my an they don't get my answer. Because my answer is keeping the commandments of God. The commandments of God are what shows love to my neighbor. Because those the, in the, within the commandments of God are to take care of my neighbor. But they don't understand that. They don't get it. It's that pearls throwing pearls to the swine, right? Which is, you know, lost my way for the fact that I can count. Um, but the uh, but it's also that problem of don't rebuke an idiot. If you just like uh, you know, if you go if you go in the with the pig, you're just gonna get dirty. Yeah, oh, right. like the Which part the proverb? Uh, yep, don't rebuke the idiot. Uh, <laughs> the uh, that is that is Proverbs. That is Proverbs nine seven through eight. Don't rebuke an idiot. You nine, just, seven through eight. What's that? Did you say nine, nine, seven, nine uh, Proverbs nine verses seven and eight. Okay, okay I do that. I thought you might. <laughs> so you're standing there, and your neighbor says, "Get back." Uh, to be honest, um, and again, this was tough for them. They didn't like this answer at all. Uh, so I don't argue on the science and all the nonsense, right? It's, so it's worthless. They can't hear it, right? You guys know this. They can't hear it, right? So uh, it doesn't matter what study you reference. Really, it doesn't matter. And so I just, I just say it. There's going to come a period of time where if we do not comply, we will not be allowed to buy and sell. Okay? So is the COVID vaccination the market to be? Not yet for me, because I haven't got it and I'm still allowed to buy and sell. And that needs to be, a, you got to agree, that that's to be a worldwide thing. It can't be an isolated thing. They're certainly making an effort to get there. Okay? It doesn't, you know, we're getting distracted by other stuff, but that's an ongoing thing. Right? So in my profession right now, I'm technically a, uh, a government contractor. And as you guys probably saw in the news, there was a point where our illustrious president of the United States, uh, also the commander in chief, declared that if you were a government contractor, you had to get vaccinated. Well, here I stand before you, government contractors, to learn and 
paycheck who is unvaccinated. Um, and the uh, and then so anyway, so that got challenged in court, and that got put a stay on it. And but that's still out there. And and I have no, I don't follow the case. I have no idea where what that's going on. But because of that, I I the decisions that I'm making, the things that I'm doing, are assuming that my primary revenue stream are going to get taken away. Um, yeah, and, later. and and so the response back from the guy I was doing the scripture study when I pointed this out to him why I won't go near it because it has a chance to qualify and so I'm not going there right uh, plus I know what the, the mark of God is that's the counterfeit the true one comes from anybody the Shema all right so the so the so oh, by the way when asked what's the most important thing he said the Shema well it's pretty important not to accept the mark of the beast shocker the Shema theoretically protects us from that if we understand it right so the so anyway so they, they don't like the mark of the beast thing at all it makes me sound crazy I'm sure to them right yeah. um, but here we are and, and so how many people were not allowed to go to grocery stores if they wouldn't put on a mask how many people were not uh, that got actually have been fired from their jobs because they wouldn't comply it is happening yet the cognitive dissonance still makes it so that guy can't see it which I, I don't even talk to him anymore I mean I wave to him when he drives by but I just I can't I can't take it anymore and get back to the problem. Just a comment. <laughs> in the in the Mormon conception, protecting everyone from risk at all times was essentially Lucifer's plan. Interesting. Yeah. The uh, I I say so. The way I say it is, um, you, know, you know, another great lie, right? It's the it's the job of the government to protect us. Is a big lie. Okay, that's a huge lie. And here's my rebuke to that. Okay, remember I'm supposed to rebuke. Okay, my rebuke is no, it's not. No, it's not. They are not supposed to protect me at all times because, oh, by the way, that's not even remotely close to possible. Okay, can't do it. All right, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to provide an environment where I can protect myself and my family and my neighbors. Okay, and what do you got to have to have that? Okay, I can't stop a Russian invasion myself. They got to take care of that. Okay. But if you let me have the tools, okay? Remember, Christ said, if you don't have a sword, sell your garment and get one. Today, that sword is chambered in 556, okay? Mm -hmm. So the, uh, that's, a, that's, that's what I need. I, if, if, if I get overwhelmed, I need a force multiplier, okay? And I need the protection of God. And what's the protection of God? To keep his commandments, okay? And if I do those things, by the way, probably not where I need that to happen there in Egypt offering that protection okay so the ideal is to never need to squeeze that trigger okay um but there you go yeah yeah um i just want to comment i really enjoyed that that's the truth that's the truth i'm a word person so finding um the origins of the word finding how what the biblical definitions of things are what is love what is salvation what is um sin all of the biblical definitions really help to clarify and move us forward in the world. And so I really enjoyed that fact that you were able to pull that together and um, it's such a good, a great study lesson in that. Amen. I would tell you, I'll share one last thing uh, for a second. So, so I'm not, a, so I don't speak multiple languages. Um, I wasn't raised in this. Uh, just read the book and try to do what it says. And so here is then my, so my mom, here's where the, the corner turned, okay? And so I picked it up open page one and I read it all the way through, okay? And so now at least I was generally aware of the whole thing. And I didn't do, I was not, I stopped. I honestly, I stopped after the first five books. And I was like, got it, God. And I stopped. Uh, no, that's not true. I read the first five books. Then I read uh, the gospel, looking for where Christ told us to stop. I didn't find it, okay? Um, and so right there, I achieved all of uh, my conclusions. None of those conclusions have changed. I read the first five books and I read the five gospels or four gospels and I stopped. I, I, achieved, I have not, not a single one of my conclusions has changed um, as I have read more. Eventually, I had enough people pick at me about what I was saying that in order to defend myself, I felt obligated to read the rest, okay? And so out of self-defense, I went and started reading the rest. So I read all the way, I eventually read all the way through and now the model, uh, and I give, I got to give credit to a guy that calls that refers to himself as PJ. Um, 
and uh, Pastor Joe is what that stands for. Um, he's now retired as a pastor, if you will. But he was giving, uh, he, gave, he had a talk on YouTube about the Passover. And so um, I've never met him, but I know people who know him. And the uh, and so I was, I was curious what he would have to say on that. And I, don't, I didn't really catch much of that, but, but believe it or not, what he said, I didn't even listen to the whole sermon. The part that he, that he pointed out that at that point, I just finished going through the Torah again. And now I, I was working my way through the New Testament again. And, the, um, and then he made this point, okay? And, and, and I think we'd agree. The, the part where we're weak is the Torah. The Christianity keeps us in the New Testament, in the Book of Mormon, and so on and so forth, and tells us that the, the Old Testament is not worth our time. It's like just a historical study, right? It's, and, and it's not worth our time. But we in this group, okay, and for the purpose of this conference, understand that it's foundational, right? And so we need to, and that's our rock, right? That's the rock of the foundation. So we need to keep building upon that. And so the thing that I, they took away from that is he said, so he, he suggested that you should read Torah every day. So I read a chapter of Torah every day. And it turns out if you do that, you finish it twice a year. So you're on a faster cycle than the than the than the uh, than, um, the, uh, the Torah portion, which can only get you through it once a year. And then on top of that, I read the Proverbs every day. So on the first of the month, I read the Proverbs one, and so on and so forth. And then on top of that, as questions come up within our fellowship or whatever, I'm 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 reading other things, or I'm trying to compile scriptures uh, on a given subject or whatever. Uh, and now and then I stopped kind of reading it again beyond what I just described and was constantly trying to pull scriptures together and i've now i've now hit me okay i gotta get back to where i start reading again so so i started pile i started going through the gospels again with the intention to go through the new testament again and the um but here's the thing that i find so here's what i do different than most is is i don't stop and try to figure things out i don't understand i plow through which is why i was such a horrible student probably um i plow through I'm not looking to try to figure out things I don't understand. I assume that if I don't understand them, it's because God doesn't think I'm ready yet. Because what has happened every single time I go through, something else connects, something else makes sense that I didn't see the last time I went through. My assumption is that's the next thing God wants me to focus on. Okay, so you know, he, so he's got all these stiff-necked people that won't do anything, and all of a sudden, one of them turns back to him. Now we're in Deuteronomy uh, 30, okay? So in Deuteronomy 30, this is where we're at. And now as people, we've, we've been scattered, and now we're confused, and we're following all this idolatry and everything. But then in the latter days, we're going to turn back, right? And then so all of a sudden, you decide to keep the Sabbath, okay? And just think of the joy of heaven, right? And you think of all the terms about that, right? And then he goes, all right, so you figured out the Sabbath. Cool. So here's the next one. Will you do this one too? And then you incorporate that in your life. And he goes, oh. How about this one? Would you do this one? Would you do this one? Okay, is the number 613? I don't think the number is 613, but you get the idea, okay? And so I'm not looking for the things that I don't understand because if I anchor there, where am I going to go to? I'm going to go to somebody's book about it, and I'm going to get the opinion of man. I'm not looking for the opinion of man. To be honest and blunt, I don't care, okay? I care what God has to say. And so I keep going through, and what I am personally finding is each time I do that, I connect other scriptures together and I get a fuller picture on something that I can incorporate in my life today. And then I do, and I keep reading, looking for God to give me the next one. That's my process.